Actually, I did it that time. We're both here. It's not going back and forth. Ooh. He's like still going. Oh, that's how you do it. That's how you fade in the beginning from your, your intro title. Ah, oh, God, that's how you do it. And wow. then the music cut out so smoothly, too. I know. That's exactly what I've been trying to do since the beginning, and I kept messing it up every time. And it's one button. It's literally, I just kept hitting the wrong button. Um, but here we are. Back for another episode, another installment of the Unwatched Pile, the show where we dust off, get the dust off, get the Swiffer thingy out, whatever it is you use, uh, dust off the Blu-rays that you've just been sitting there, you've been meaning to watch them, but you've been like, you know, maybe have a lot going on at work, so you get home late, or maybe your wife is nagging you all the time, hey, go take out the garbage. Every time you try to watch, you never have time for it, but finally you've found a window, and you've you pick one off the list and then you're like this i'm do i'm watching this and that's what we do here we watch one we talk about it um and then we pair it with something that we've already seen that's in our collections that we're like you know this would be a great double feature when i get back around to this movie to watch it again i'm gonna double feature it with this one uh so yeah here we are again uh andrew how you feeling it's christmasy doing we got good, christmas doing stuff good. on yeah yeah i got a little festive i figured you know, since our last episode was noir, noir themed for Noir November, I put on a fedora, <clears throat> and I thought at the last possible moment, "Hey, do I have a Santa Claus esque hat that yeah. I could possibly don?" And I did. I also That's put good. on yeah. some flannel because it's that time of year. If you live in the colder area, trying to get my my uh, ensemble on, a la Rock Hudson and all that heaven allows, wore a lot of flannel in there. Uh, Mimic the brawny paper towel man. Yeah. You know that yeah. lumberjacking looking guy. I almost um, wore some flannel, I, I, but I was like, now nah, I'm going to go with the Tommy Wiseau Christmas shirt. Nice. Well played. Yeah. Well played. So, um, yeah, I always say that I'm going to I'm going to get more flannel, wear more flannel. And uh, I finally did. So I fulfilled I fulfilled the awesome, dream man. today. All right. Uh, so I'm going to say Tim, the tool man, Taylor, though, instead of Brawny man. OK. All Brownie right. Man. Whatever you prefer, as long as it's a compliment. Yeah, um, it is. Uh, but we do have a, guest, a special guest, as we always do here for this episode of The Unwatched Pile, episode number eight. I always forget what episode we're on, uh, but it's. Uh, but who do we have, Stephen? I'll let oh, you do the well, intro. Well, we've had him on as a guest uh, on Chasing Labels before. He's uh, one of the hosts uh, of uh, the Indicator cast, and he also is a co-host over at the Inprint cast, and that is Mr. John Matthews, coming from Australia. How you doing, man? Doing good, doing good, gentlemen. Uh, I was just saying earlier, it's uh, very hot down here. And, uh, so I've got the aircon blasting, but yeah, doing well. Yeah, a hot Good, Christmas. man, good. Um, is this a time of year you get a lot of movie watching done? Are you? Uh, I do, yeah, because obviously so busy throughout the year with work, but uh, I, I get a good like two weeks off. So this is my movie catch up. Good. So yeah, gonna yeah. got a big pile of stuff to get through. So yeah, it's it's a good excuse to get caught up. With movies awesome are your is your unwatched pile pretty pretty large yeah since uh mainly because of black friday i mean i was getting like because yeah. they're all coming at once all the packages now so just stacks and stacks you know and, and obviously severin hasn't shipped and there's a whole bunch of labels that, that are showing up so i've got a lot to catch up on so yeah this is the busiest time for movie watching for me as well awesome it's too much uh yeah oh yeah yeah do you get to the theater a lot yeah yeah i, I try to i um been been a bit busy the last movie i saw was um godzilla minus one so i saw that I, i'm hearing great things uh, oh yeah. highly Amazing. recommend it saw it in 4d so the chair was rocking around and oh okay water in my face but uh yeah i try and get to the get to the cinema and i'll see if there's anything playing over the holidays down here as well awesome man awesome um so we got a few comments in here uh josephine jumped in before we even started and left a bunch of comments oh. um she loves to she loves to tell us about a lot of first time watching. She's been watching a lot of Christmas stuff lately. Um, she also uh, wanted to let me know she she heard Hooba Stank on the radio and were thought of me um, because you know I, you know how I like to sing on Chasing Labels. Um, <laughs> and uh, she she asked me uh, favorite Christmas movie performances. Let's talk about that for a second. You know, uh, I'm always a huge fan of the movie Scrooge with Bill Murray. So like his performance in that movie is kind of a top notch one for me. I just love. You know, it's 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 a it's so many different things, like even down to like slapstick, like the part where he like leaves the restaurant, slips in the water and like falls in the ground. Like it's just a lot of a lot of great moments like that. Uh, any favorite performances in a Christmas mo Christmas movies between you guys? Andrew, uh, I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to go classic and go traditional Jimmy Stewart. And it's a wonderful life. Okay. Uh, Harry Grant and the Bishop's Wife. OK, Um, 
I guess I'll just plug that because it would be nice if we could get a nice Blu-ray re-release of that. Um, because we had a Blu-ray years ago, but it went out of print and it's going for too much money on eBay now. Yeah. Uh, too much. Uh, but that's kind of, but that's, um, remember the movie, The Preacher's Wife with Denzel Washington? Yeah. That's a yeah. remake of The Bishop's Wife. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. Cary Grant plays the angel. And then, of course, in The Preacher's Wife, it's Denzel, I think, plays the angel. If I remember correctly. They had that on TV, on cable all the time growing up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking of those two. Um, George C. Scott and um, one of the Christmas, um, what's the, yeah, Christmas Carol, right? One of, the, one of the many adaptations. One of the many adaptations. Oh, cool. uh, um, a Muppet Christmas Carol, classic. Uh, Michael okay, King, don't, don't, don't well, say man. all of them. Leave some for John here. I know. Okay. <laughs> I, I just got to plug in my Muppets for a second. Okay. All Muppets. right. We, yeah. Uh, John, what you got? Oh, this, I was going to say Wonderful Life. That's a classic yeah. I, I watch for the family every year. Um, I would say more modern ones, uh, definitely Billy Bob Thornton and Bad Santa. That's become a bit of a classic yeah, it's pretty, Christmas film yeah. for me each year. Um, I saw it when it came out, loved it. And I, I begin to appreciate each more just how dark the tone is, uh, but also very, very warm hearted the film is as well, because the, um, the, the sequel completely missed that. But obviously the first one uh, had yeah. that good balance as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess... National Lampoon's Vacation, Christmas Vacation, <laughs> Chevy Chase, Just Going Crazy. That's one of my favorites. So there's so many. I'm just, yeah, those are the ones that come to mind right now. Yeah, you know, there's always an ongoing debate about uh, what is a pure Christmas movie. And I yeah. hate them every year. I hate hearing about them because personally, I am I am on the more of a purist side. Like I have a certain stance about Christmas movies. I'm not one of them. I mean, like I, I, I know I can say that there is a thing of, of alternative Christmas movies that people like, like Die Hard. Mm -hmm. To me, that's alternative. I don't consider them really Christmas movies, but if you like that at Christmas, that's fine. That's It, it works for you. Um, but uh, yeah, let's get to it. Um, oh, we got some more comments. Uh, Film Nuts, uh, he said, hi, gents. And then he said, uh, do you need the horror Christmas films? That's uh, that's Tony Meaches. Oh, is saying. it Tony? Tony, hey. Yeah. He's, he's, he tries to be incognito. He, he's yeah, yeah, all... trying to be under the radar. I know what that is. <laughs> well, we'll get Tony on. We're going to get Tony on this show, of course, uh, at some point here soon. So, um, but uh, let's get into it, guys. Let's do our, you know, I didn't make it a criteria that we had to do Christmas movies because it's kind of tough. Like, mm. you know, to have Christmas movies in your collection isn't a, isn't a crazy thing, but to have not watched them is kind of hard, you know, because. Most of the time, Christmas movies are pretty easy watches, and I think most of us would watch most of the Christmas movies that we probably have. Mm -hmm. I will say, out of the three of us, I am the one that did actually have Christmas movie in his collection he hadn't watched, which was, of course, if anybody has seen my posts, you know what it is. We'll get around to me. But, um, yeah. So, uh, But otherwise, it's going to be like another unwatched pile, uh, kind of just up in the air, random stuff. Um, you're our guest, John, so please tell us your uh, your first time watch. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, look, there was there was so much sitting on the shelf, um, and and the same with you guys. I was thinking something maybe Christmassy, but it was difficult because I didn't have any Christmas movies I hadn't seen. Because once yeah. I get in the mail, I watch it like I watch it before Christmas. So, um, so look, I, I was scouring the shelves, and look, I'm a big fan of Mondo Macabro, what those guys do. Oh yeah, um, yeah, Jared and them. So um, yeah, look, I had this sitting on the shelf. This is one of the um, I, I guess one of the the Japanese doubles they did. So they released these two on the same day, um, Curse of the uh, Dog God and also the Inferno. So they were both sealed on the shelf and they'd just been staring at me for ages. I'm like, all right, that's it. I'm going to finally watch those because they've been sitting there. Um, so I pulled off the shelf and I decided to pick this one, which is Inferno. So um, never seen this film, obviously, um, but it, um, you know, I love my Japanese horror and, once again, not not very Christmassy because it deals with hell. Uh, but obviously, the title is the Inferno. Um, but the actual Japanese title is uh, Jigoku uh, from 1979. And uh, yeah, this was a um, a really interesting film. I, I actually enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, once again, not not really one to put on at Christmas because it is quite um, bleak and disturbing. But essentially, the plot is. Um, in this small Japanese town, uh, like in the 50s, there's uh, an affair that goes on between this couple. And uh, it's a bit of adultery, and the town knows about it. Uh, but then with jealousy, um, uh, the um, husband of, of the lover comes and, and kills them both, basically kills the, the two having the affair. 
And the mother who was having the affair does give birth to a baby just before she dies. And it's pretty grotesque. You see this little ugly fetus coming out. It's, um, yeah, pretty, pretty graphic imagery. Um, but that daughter would survive uh, despite her mother being killed. And uh, the mother goes to hell and you actually see her going down to hell. And um, But the daughter um, gets taken away and she comes back to the town you know, 20 years later or 20 or 30 years later. And, um, and no one knows that that's her. She was the daughter that survived. And uh, she basically infiltrates this family. And uh, when she comes into this family, she starts, weird things start happening, like very supernatural things. Um, uh, I think there's a, there's a Japanese t legend that if the windmill spins the opposite way, you're going to hell. And uh, basically, bad things start happening to these family members one by one. So it's a bit of a revenge tale. Uh, I don't want to give away too much, but... Um, let me just say that uh, it's it's quite disturbing. There is some pretty graphic imagery, um, and you actually get to see hell. So based on the um, you know the uh, uh, the Buddhist um, Japanese hell, so you actually see there's an amazing sequence that goes for about twenty minutes in hell. We've got you know demons of pitchforks, um, you know people being crushed into like a, a grinding pot with blood pouring out, like really amazing stuff. Like visually, it's a very visual, beautiful film. Um, and the other thing about this film, I have to say, is that the cast, like this is not a throwaway, you know, B-grade, um, you know, Japanese horror film. This actually has very prestigious actors and actresses. So you'll notice a lot of faces from old school samurai films. Um, one of the big standouts is um, Kyoto Kishida. Now, she was in all the new wave Japanese films like Woman in the Dunes, um, Ozu films, Manji. Uh, and she's actually in this, um, who was obviously the... Um, one of the mothers in the film who um who this daughter's getting revenge on and uh and she she plays it really straight and once again the performances are um like i said everyone's playing it straight so that's why it works because everyone's taking it very seriously i guess in if this was done in a western context it could have been a bit pokey or campy um look the film uh what else can i say the film also has a little bit of some i guess you could say some quite disturbing incest themes um so there is some weird stuff going on there, kind of hinted at with brothers and sisters and stuff. So that's also that was a very strange thing that the film had. Um, but there's also um, some. Well, the, the director was a um, was actually like a softcore uh, pinku director, and pinku was like a, a film genre in Japan where they basically had these theaters playing softcore movies. So it has got some weird softcore scenes, so a lot of nudity. Uh, but if you can get past some of that, um, it's a very interesting graphic disturbing amazing japanese horror film so uh, that was my little praising on it and uh yeah i hope everyone checks out inferno it's my little mini review <laughs> awesome man I, yeah you got me interested it you know how you were describing it it was making me um think about a movie i really enjoyed picking <laughs> up this year from eureka um um samurai reincarnation yes um yeah it, it, you know something where it's like very kind of like you know going into like afterlife and like kind of dealing with you know revenge of these ghosts come from it was just really visual a visual movie um that i really loved and uh yeah that sounds cool man i, I love disturbing stuff like that um and uh i'm guessing the limited editions probably i mean i it sells out really fast all of them do yeah, I think the red case one's gone. You can get, the, I yeah. think, the retail one and the blue case is still available. Yeah. But um, and there's a really good essay from Jasper Sharp, who um, you know, does all the Japanese. Um, uh, yeah, he's done a lot of books as well and articles. But it, it kind of shows you some of the, the imagery as well. But yeah, it's um, yeah, if you can still even get the standard edition, definitely. Oh yeah, I yeah. Really recommend it. Mondo do great stuff, and hey, I'm glad it, into Japanese films. It's a Christmas movie, man. It's got a lot of red in it. Um, <laughs> that's people. That's some people's criteria for Christmas movies. Um, but uh, yeah, man, red case, red, red blood. It's close. That's close. It's close pretty enough. close. It's pretty close. When you mentioned Jigoku, my mind immediately went to the 1960 film Jigoku. Yep. And I was like, wait a minute, they put that out on Blu ray. And it's like, no, no. <laughs> and that yeah. movie is similar in the sense that it's known for its graphicness of depiction of hell and depiction of like torture and being in graphics specifically for its time you know 1960 is not quite 1979 but still it's rather graphic and that movie i believe was has only been available on dvd from criterion for uh, yeah. a long time while and, we're on the topic i was about to say uh, this is the criterion dvd only so this is not my pairing but it was an honorable mention because uh, it's it's a semi-remake this film but criterion have done a dvd of it but yeah you're right andrew 
Yeah, that was the that was the immediate one that I was thinking of. And that movie is streaming on the Criterion channel for anyone interested. That specific one, not the yep. one that um that John was talking about. But yeah, it's part of that Japanese new wave. Yeah, that yes. of like the nineteen fifties and nineteen sixties, you know, with Kurosawa and Ozu and all of those guys. Um but yeah, that's that's where my mind immediately went. But they're both similar films. Yep. I mean, in terms of pushing the envelope and what you could do in cinema at that time. Um, yeah, Mondo Macabre always finding some type of hidden yeah, dude, they, oddball stuff. <laughs> another one, the, another one they put out this year I, uh, that I really liked was The Fear. That, yes, uh, I think it's a Greek film, I believe. It, yeah, it, it was great. I picked that. It, I just picked it up on a whim, and it blew me away. I thought it was an amazing movie. So yeah, they find them uh, from around the globe, all types of genre films. So yeah, Mondo, yeah. keep doing what you're doing. Most definitely. All right, Andrew. Oh, uh, it is my turn. It is your turn, <laughs> Mr. Oh, uh, Tim, Tim the Toolman Taylor. Nice. Um, so my pick, obviously, if you saw the promo, if you did, it was the movie Red Sun, uh, the film directed by Rudolf uh, Tome, I believe uh, is the pronunciation. Perhaps not. Um, is This is a film from 1970. It's put out by Radiance Films, um, as you can see here. And I've gotten so many radiance releases from this year not i'm not as close to complete as i thought i was <laughs> the other day uh they posted a release that they had put out like 36 individual releases this calendar year and i was like i don't think i have that many <laughs> nor do i i think i have room for that many but i'm slowly but surely getting there but this was one i picked up several months ago and i just picked this off the pile and was like let me give this a watch so this is a kind of it's a it's a new german film it's a film that's part of the whole new german um like wave of cinema every culture seemingly got some type of new wave at some point in time whether it was france in the 1960s whether it was uh the british new wave in like the 60s and 70s um and whether it was this also in kind of the uh, you know the 70s and 80s really um think of people like Werner herzog um then vendors rainer Werner fassbender uh, those are the type of you know german filmmakers of that time this was of course uh, you know there was germany was split between west and east germany i believe this is an east german film um and this is an, an odd type of i would say nihilistic type of film um, it, there's this guy who is this drifter and he's, he kind of runs into a woman working as a bartender at some bar that he kind of wanders, wanders into, and he ends up striking up a relationship with her and they have a back and forth and he's, and basically he doesn't have any place to stay. So he decides to stay with her, but she has a few roommates and, her and, and this woman and her roommates have this kind of odd pact that they have together where they don't like to stay in relationships with men for more than five days. Uh, they have to get out of it, the relationship, somehow after five days. It's a little spoilerific if I tell you how they do it, but it's, it's a bit sinister. I'll say that. Um, and they keep him around for well past that time frame. And it's kind of just him slowly figuring out what's the deal here? What's going on? Um, why do men keep like coming and going and like disappearing? What is happening here? And the film is told in a very stripped down style. Uh, even the acting seems very matter of fact and nihilistic. Not a lot of emotion happening in this film. And I don't know if that was purposely done or if that was done just because that's the way the actors and act actresses played it. Um, but uh, so the film isn't like a gripping thriller or suspenseful in any way. It, like I said, it's way more nihilistic, stripped down, matter of factly. Um, it's probably not going to be a film for everyone. People may get frustrated with the lack of actually meaningful things happening. So, I just have to warn people about that. It was not quite what I was expecting. Um, the film looks way more intriguing here than it actually is. Like there's a woman here with a gun on the front. There's a woman with a gun on the back. And you may think that that would lead to some type of, you know, exciting things happening, but mm, perhaps not. Uh, but this is a really good release from, from Radiance. Um, 
it's it, the movie clocks in only about 87 minutes long. The one spe there's two special features on here. One is about 21 minutes long and one is 50 minutes long. So that's that's a lot. And the 50 minute long film is kind of all about talking about um, the political context in which the film was made, uh, political context, what was going on in Europe and Germany at that time. Of course, this is right in the middle of the Cold War. So a lot of political things happening with that. Um, and also just the, talking about the German new wave and how it kind of played off of the politics of the time. Um, and then there's like a visual essay here talking about, you know, certain visual things in the film. Not a very visually sumptuous film, some beautiful shots, but not very visual film. Like I said, very very stripped down. Um, but yeah, Radiance, as always, does uh, a rather thick booklet and stuff like that. So that's really cool. Um, reversible cover art in here as well. Um, but yeah, I really uh, found myself intrigued by the film more than thinking the film was like this type of grand hidden gem. Uh, but yet again, I went into a completely blind, not really knowing what it was. Uh, so I was relatively surprised by what I was seeing. And um, luckily, the film wasn't long, so it wasn't like a slow burn. It got to the point, got to certain points very, very quickly. All right. Mm. Cool. Well, that's good, man. Uh, once again, you you you, you did try without probably trying. Uh, stay with the red theme. You put red in the title. I did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I did. I wasn't planning on that uh, at all. Yeah. That's a yeah. good choice. I, I, you know, I have a bunch of that radiant stuff too, and I gotta, I gotta delve into. I, I'm just trying not to go straight for radiance because the, they're so new. I'm trying to go to my back stuff, my backpack stuff that mm -hmm. I have really got dust on it. So, but I am gonna get to a radiance eventually. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I've got, I've got that release, Andrew. It's, it's sitting on the shelf sealed. I still haven't watched it, so I, I'm gonna crack it open now and give it a watch. So yeah, mm -hmm. like you said, Tony, I'm. I'm very yeah, Tony's intrigued. intrigued. You got him. You sold Tony. So yeah, um, and Radiant's nice. yeah, pumping out so much as well. Like so much. Yeah. And friends just. They had them. a very very impressive first year. Yeah. Like yeah. loads of uh, consistency and like like tons of hidden gems and great releases and and I was pleasantly surprised. And they they've they've already gotten what a quarter into the next year in terms of releases as well. So it's a, like a nonstop train right now. Yeah, it's one of them things. It's like I don't have, I, I, I can't, I can't see myself up front paying for a subscription. But the thing is, is if I could, I would because, I mean, it, it's just I end up wanting to buy all of them. Mm, so I feel you. Uh, I'm, but, I'm but I just can't, I just can't put anything. I can't put that much money up front. Like yeah, a thousand dollars, over like a thousand dollars. Like, no, nah, I can't. Do I that. like to go at my own pace. Yeah. You know I mean? Like, yeah. like if I could get some here and there, sometimes there'll, there'll be a sale somewhere yeah. and I'll grab a couple or grab and, and one. The, yeah. And this know. is exactly what I just did. They had that sale that just popped on Radiance's site. Mm. And I grabbed four. I grabbed the uh, Altman titles, a um, yep. couple other yeah. ones too. I grabbed four last month from, yep. their, from their website oh, right. that they had during Black Friday. Um, I just ordered a couple from Diabolic. They had a little sale going on there too. So it's like you slowly but surely. If you want to complete a collection, you can get there somehow. Um, some like to get it all at once. I like to slowly get my way towards my he, goal. He likes I'm to like, wait like it's almost out of the limited edition and then pop. Yeah, in. then I panic. Yeah. Then I panic. <laughs> book now that they do a they do a six month subscription too. So if you want to yeah. just give the go for six months, it's like halfway. I did that last year. I actually went for six months and then. I was so sold on what they did. I went for a year, so <laughs> and, <laughs> I sacrificed because obviously, um, yeah, Vincent's doing their subscription this year, and I'm I'm not sure. So I, I, I'm I Radiance are more the type of films that I'm interested in. So we'll see what yeah. happens. So I gladly support Radiance, but yeah, they you eventually, like I said, you can just pick and choose as you go and get them. Yeah, all. yeah. All but right. speaking of limited editions, Stephen, I know oh, you've got one here. Of course, I do. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, uh, is is out of print, and then I really want to get my hands on somehow. Oh, is it out of print? print? That's that sucks. Well, well, uh, hopefully uh, somebody else puts this out at a premium. Um, you um, you can find this movie somewhere. You gotta find, Andrew go scrap the end. You, you'll find this. Oh, I can. You can find it. <laughs> cool. Well, the, the one we're talking about here is uh, one that's you know it came out I think at the end of 2022, um, and uh, from the company Indicator, which of course John's a big fan of. He does a podcast on just focuses on the indicator uh guys and uh, they you just had the two main guys from indicator on uh john and sam 
Uh, yes. So go listen to that podcast. They talk. Um, I, they talk about uh, the past year and uh, some new stuff, future you know tidbits there. So go check that out. But um, the one I chose here is is a Christmas film, and uh, it's starring Bar- uh, Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray, and that is Remember the Night. Um, and uh, just I mean just alone. Uh, the the two actor main actors here were were what sold me. I was like, well, this team up, you know, the double indemnity team up, yeah. Before double, in- I gotta I gotta see this. Um, and of course, it's written by Preston Preston Sturgis, who's a of course very prolific uh, writer director of the time. Uh, a lot of great stuff, a lot of great comedies, uh, whether it's uh, Sullivan Travels or, um, yeah. I mean, it's it's he. It, I knew going into this 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 was highly kind of rated and that I should, I should enjoy it. And, uh, I did, I enjoyed this a lot. Um, the, the setup here is, is that you have, uh, it just goes right into the events of, uh, Barbara Stanwyck, who's, uh, decides to, uh, have a theft, do a theft. She, she steals a bracelet, she gets caught and then, uh, it's right around Christmas time. So, uh, right before Christmas. And so Fred McMurray plays a lawyer who uh, is there to, you know, put her in jail. But he decides that, you know, it's Christmas, and he decides to kind of stall the proceedings till after the holidays. And as he's leaving, um, basically he sees that th- that Barbara Stanwyck's character is going to be spending basically Christmas in jail. So he decides to get her bailed out and let her go, you know, go have Christmas with her family until after the holidays. But what ends up happening is that the bail bondsman thinks that he's trying to, uh, you know, get get with the girl, you know. So he brings her to his place, and then from there, it, that's when everything starts. It, you know, he, uh, you know, she he gives her a way out, but then she's like, you know, what? I'll just stay with you, you know. And then from there, uh, you know, he it turns to it turns then it turns to a road movie, um, and then they kind of go on the road. He's going to see his family, but on the way her family is nearby. So he goes to, they get, and then there's a lot of, a lot of things I don't want to give away. So it's, you know, it's, it's a, a sweet, you know, love story that happens over time. Kind of reminded me a little bit of it happened one night uh, in the sense of that kind of like two people that kind of have, you know, obvious differences. And then they, over time, as they go through things, start to slowly fall in love with each other in different ways. And, um, a lot of it's about like, you know, they assume the other person's one thing that they're not just because of their appearance or their, their, what they perceive as their background. Uh, you know, a lot of very human things. And I think that that's what part of what made Preston Sturgis such a great writer was not only his dialogue was really witty and snappy and stuff, you know, but like he created characters that were pretty real, you know, that felt like real interpersonal relationship stuff. And, um, yeah, and it's set around Christmas. Of course, even New Year's gets put into this film too. You get New Year's as well. So, really good holiday film. It's a really good classic holiday film from 1939. And uh, yeah, who else here has has seen Remember the Night? I, I have. Yeah. Okay, John. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really sweet film. I, I I enjoyed. I saw when that release came out. I don't know when that was. Maybe over a year ago. But yeah, it's um yeah. I really enjoyed it too. It was a great film. Just a classic. Andrew, yeah, I've I've seen it as well. I'm pretty sure I watched it <clears throat> when we had to cover it for the podcast. You always and did when it was announced, and it was probably a movie I had wanted to see anyway, given the fact that it's starring Barbara mm. Stanwyck and Fred McMurray, and like you said, written by Preston Sturges. Um, it's a film um, that, yeah, it's got that it happened one night feel to it. Um, it's, it's not quite yeah. screwball comedy like. Like no, it, 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 it happened sincere. one night has a little bit more. It's a little more, like I think a little. I wouldn't say wacky, but like it's a little bit more cutesy. Like it's mm. a little more. But but this is a little bit more. Has I think a little bit more drama in it. It's a little more dr- dramatic. Yep. Um, yeah, that's what I say. This one's a little yeah. more serious, given the situation. Yeah, I mean, granted, the situation didn't happen one night. Is like a reporter following somebody and not telling them and stuff like that. But this one is more like someone committed a crime and it's going to prison and it exactly. has like that limited amount of time before perhaps their freedom's going there's, to be There's taken a little away. bit of a yeah, clock. In like a movie. ticking clock. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I didn't say this, the ending is amazing. Like an ending, mm. go, it goes in a direction that 
you wouldn't think for a movie, a Hollywood movie that always wants to go for like the super happy ending. Of course, this is like after the code. So like, you know, and that's part of what made Preston Sturgis and other, other filmmakers of that time. So great is that they've found a way to work in like sexual into window and, and, and things like that without being, you know, getting it past the code, you know, like they really mm -hmm. did a good job. He did a good job of working that stuff in and, and how, how he ends the film. It really is pretty, pretty, pretty hard hitting there at the end. So, um, yeah, it's a great addition. It's got, you know, of course, alternate covers, um, you know, inside here. And then it came with not only a great, uh, thick, uh, booklet here, but, uh, it has a poster as well. So you get the poster, um, great addition, uh, features. It, it is, a, you know, fu funny enough, indicator is always known for having tons of features. It is a little limited on features. It does have some, like it has like the radio plays and stuff like that, which is mm -hmm. cool. Um, but when it comes to like, like video essays and things like that, it's only got like a couple, like it's got, um, um, one where they talk about the director, uh, Mitchell Lyson, who is kind of an underrated director of the time. Cause I mean, like I said, Preston Sturgis wrote it. So he gets all the press on this movie, but the director is actually a pretty solid director as, uh, as well. And he had a pretty good career. So um, yeah, it's a great addition. Indicator always puts out great limited editions, great everything. So that is my pick. Uh, uh, remember the night. And uh, so we'll come back around to me uh, with my double feature, but John, please share with us what you paired with the Inferno. It has to be something that's completely dry of blood, right? Yeah. <laughs> complete opposite. <laughs> yeah, look, it, it, was, it was tough. Um, yeah, and and once again, not very pleasant in terms of uh, Christmas movies. But yeah, the obvious pairing was uh, Jigoku. That was just an honorable mention. Andrew mentioned earlier, so that was um, the Criterion one only on DVD. So I decided to go with something different. I think what can because obviously you see Hell for about twenty minutes in that film. I'm like, what other film shows Hell um, from a different context? And so. Um, Yes, after deciding and scouring the shelves, I went with the uh, a film by the Allman family. So <laughs> speaking of how... Oh, yeah. So this is um, a great set that, um, speaking of Indicator, they did as well, which is on the um, From Hollywood to Heaven. But there's just one film on here in particular because uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a massive box set uh, that deals with the subject matter. And that is... Sorry, I'm just trying to find it here. Oh, here we go. And this is the film from uh, 1974 called The Burning Hell. And um, okay, close right there. Yeah. So, um, in case you don't know the Allman family story, basically they were a family of exploitation filmmakers um, from around the, I believe, I'm trying to remember the Florida sort of area, and they were making um, basically B grade, kind of like Herschel Gordon Lewis type films. And and the first half of this box set are films like that, like um, the exotic one is one of the films, like very you know monster mash stripper type movies, like really cheesy, cheesy stuff. And then they had a basically had a plane crash, and the family survived the plane crash. And because of that, it was a vision from God that they had to uh, change their filmmaking and become Christian filmmakers. So it's the most craziest story ever because these exploitation directors became Christian filmmakers and flipped it. But their Christian films are insane; they're absolutely <laughs> bonkers. And uh, so I was thinking, well, Jigoku shows uh, an Asian hell, like a depiction of you know classic Japanese hell. What's the Christian hell? Um, so I decided to go for this film. So basically, um, they teamed up with a, um, uh, a preacher um, at the time, um, Estes W. Perkle, I believe his name was. And that's him right there on the cover. And okay. he kind of narrates these films. And he's just like, well, I'll tell you about the Bible and blah, blah. So he's just. Oh, that was tell nice. I love that. That was a good accent, man. Yeah, I tried. I tried. <laughs> I tried. Um, and and so he's like narrating the the story, just saying, oh, you know, let me tell you about hell and depictions of hell." And so it's in a church, and basically the son, um, uh, the Orman. So the father was the director, and Tim was the the son, and he actually appeared in all the films as an actor. And basically, Tim's, you know, he's he's getting caught up with the bad crowd, like a biker crowd, a bunch of hippies, you know, smoking the marijuana, you know, all this bad stuff. And then uh, basically then one day uh, all his, and then um, uh, he speaks to a, I believe like a, a priest. He's like, son, you know, you should, should repent and all this. Like, no, no, I'm, I'm with my friends. I can do what I want. It's so cheesy uh, basically, but the bikers do get in a accident. So they're on the road and they crash, but, but Tim survives. And Tim actually goes in a church after the crash, 
and this Erdis is uh, performing a sermon and he sits down and he's like, boy, you're a survivor. Let me tell you, blah, blah. And so, um, and then it actually shows his friends going to hell. And, uh, and yes, you literally see in, you know, devils of pitchforks and fires and flames and, you know, half horse people and really strange stuff. And then um, wrapped around the film, you also have uh, him giving a sermon about Moses and, and, and various stories kind of thrown in there as well. And, 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 and also bad sort of people in, uh, you know, Bible terms going to hell as well and, and, and showing them. And, but yeah, it's just, it's bizarre. It's really bizarre film. Like it's, um, you've never seen anything quite like it. Sorry. It's this one here. Um, but yeah, like literally everything you see on the poster. Um, yeah. See the hundreds biblical wonders filmed in Hollywood. And you see people like, like, yeah, covered in dirt and mud and, and burning and screaming and, and people like covered in blood. And, and there actually is gore. Like if you see someone gets stabbed and like, blood and guts ripping out it's like it's it's insane and uh and so yeah look this is um just like a bizarre imagery just one of the most it's become like a cult classic just because of how twisted and weird it is um and, and this was a film that did not go theatrically it was actually played around churches they actually went around and toured the films <laughs> to show people the before passion of the christ <laughs> exactly <had> burning hell <laughs> it, was, it was um and so once again this i guess this is christmas themed i guess because it's like a, a good christian story I, I guess um but uh yeah look if someone's looking for something really out there um this this box set's amazing but uh, yeah i want to just talk about the burning hell um this one is good as well this um what was this other one this was the um if footmen tie you what will horses do that's another really insane one but yeah the burning hell um once again there's there's a bunch of um really good extras basically this whole project was put together um by the author um what was his name? having a mental blank sorry he um uh, Jimmy, sorry, yeah, Jimmy McDonoghue, he put together that massive book called Exotic One. So yeah. uh, he did a bunch of really good extras on here, interviews, commentary. He actually got the son, Tim Mormon, to come and talk about it. Um, so, yeah, look, um, The Burning Hell, I highly recommend the set. And there's a whole bunch of crazy Christian films like that in there. But uh, that's my Ooh. double hell pairing today. So. Hell yeah. <laughs> hell yeah. Does he have an angelic voice of God uh, while narrating? Is there anything <laughs> like that? Tony, that Tony needs to know um no yeah kind of you actually do see um a supposed depiction of god in this film as well like um so because it shows the sinners like yeah. the good ones go up to heaven and you see a, a god type figure but um yeah th there is something quite like that yes okay All right. so well i got the set i just haven't digged into it yet so uh oh, you have to be prepared it's uh... <laughs> i'm excited now i'm <laughs> hearing that uh the irony is that i was actually looking at indicator releases recently and like I was just looking at that set and just remembering, oh yeah, that that set did come. I remember when it was announced, yeah. and no one knew what it was, no. which is <laughs> something that Indicator did a lot to us. I feel in two thousand and twelve, last couple years, really. I feel like I mean, they're just surprised the heck out of us, which yeah. is kind of great, really. I mean, that yeah. is kind of one of the things well, with boutique labels. Start with Ma yeah, Michael J. Murphy was a pretty pretty big one too. That was like, what is it? what the hell is this shit? Yeah, you and know, that was like, that was like their first release of the year. And it was well. Very I stuff. mean, it was. It had been it announced pushed, a long time then. ago. Yeah. 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 Like no, in the, the summer of like of twenty twenty two, but uh, there were yeah. many surprise. Even at the end of the year, they did that Todd Slaughter box. I'd never really heard of Todd Slaughter. Yeah. British. So they just surprised us, and and this was the biggest surprise um, of all. I think um, Nicholas Winning Reffin, I think, was involved as well because I think he's a huge yeah. fan. Of the, the, this this. Christian family of filmmakers. So yeah, I highly recommend the set if anyone hasn't picked it up. It, but once again, you need to be prepared. Just watch them from start to finish. So it's uh it's tough. It's tough. So. <laughs> but interesting. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, Andrew, please. Yes. Tell yes. us what you paired. Mine will not as be Reza. as obscure as really John's. No. Uh, okay, let me guess. <laughs> I'm gonna guess that it's gonna be uh Breaking Dawn uh, Twilight. No. Okay, damn it. No, no, it is not. Um, it this was actually a tough film to pair with, uh, Red Sun because I was thinking of several different things. Like, do I want to pair it with another, you know, new German film, something like from the Vendors or maybe Fassbender or something like that? And then I decided to think more abstractly. Um, I decided to go with like 
like how how do these films connect in a certain way uh, the one thing in red sun which i found rather fascinating i think one of the kind of more interesting aspects of it is it is a movie that is about a a group friend of women so i was mm -hmm. thinking okay what are films with um groups of women together in which a man then enters this this you know homeostasis society if you will and kind of you know sets things into a chaotic motion sets kind of sets things off kilter that leads to kind of negative things so i was thinking of certain films like um black narcissus uh something like that but then i decided to go with sofia coppola's the beguiled mm. um and the reason being is if you don't know the premise of this film is that it, it's similar to that to, to what I was just saying, actually very, very much to that saying, but it takes a very kind of sexual lust, lustrous turn. Um, the Black Narcissus kind of does the same thing as well, the uh, the Powell and Pressburger film, but I had Sofia Coppola on the mind because I watched her newest film last night, so that was just kind of went hand in hand with this. Um, her newest film, Priscilla. Uh, so uh, I watched uh, that apparently, last night. Apparently Tony guessed it. Oh, way to go. <laughs> Nicely done. Nicely done. Um, I actually, uh, obviously, there was one done in the 1970s, the one with Clint Eastwood, which I, I do not say, own. I'm surprised you didn't pick that one. I couldn't pair with it. I, didn't, I don't own it. Oh, come on, dude. Uh, so, I guess. Yeah, Jeez, um, how many so, movies do you have, really? Uh, God, not a lot dude. of Clint Eastwood, honestly. I got most. Of, I got more of his directing stuff, I guess, than his actual starring stuff, yeah. if that makes any sense. You know, um, Clinic. Yeah, and so I went with this one because I had Sofia Coppola on the mind. I was actually thinking also of her film The Blingering as well. Don't I, that was just why I was just something like that as well. But with this film, for those of you who don't know, it's based off of uh, the 1966 uh, book or novel. Um, it's an adaptation of that, and it takes place uh, during the Civil War at I believe an all like an all girls. Um, like a, yeah, an old girl's boarding school in the South and they come across a wounded soldier. And in this, the wounded soldier is portrayed by Colin Farrell. Uh, the cast in this film is rather magnificent. You have Nicole Kidman, Kirsten Dunst, Elle Fanning, Colin Farrell, like I just mentioned, uh, Una Lawrence and Angoris Rice, I believe, or Angori Rice. I think I did a um, full review on this movie when it came out a few years ago. That's on this channel, prob probably somewhere. Um, and I remember very much enjoying this film at the time, hence why I bought it. And what happens is they take him in and they, they're kind of hiding him because I believe he is a Union soldier. So obviously from, you know, the enemy side during the American Civil War. Uh, but what happens is this presence of this man in this all, you know, all women's, all girls uh, atmosphere kind of sets things into a chaotic environment or chaotic motion they become very illustrious after him which, which understandably so they, they did cast appropriately with colin farrell whom very many people find very attractive um, i do i do yeah, i yeah. wouldn't blame you wouldn't blame you um <laughs> so it, this whole world of yours is just set asunder by him and then things take a more you know get deeply more psychotic more obsessive and get darker and darker until until things kind of you know blow up and in negative ways and in which way that kind of connects with red sun. Cause that happens a bit as well. Um, so that's why I connected it. Um, I've always been a fan of Sofia Coppola's work. I've, I've gotten most of her films. I'm, the only films I'm missing from her in my collection are um, uh, Marie Antoinette and the bling ring. That's the only two films yeah. from her I'm missing. Um, not because I don't like them just because I haven't, I haven't gotten them yet. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of hoping for maybe a re-release of Marie Antoinette because the current release I think is only uh, from like a Sony Choice Blu-ray, and those Sony Choice Blu-rays aren't like in the aren't the best quality, and it's, they're kind of expensive for no real reason other oh than having the name Sony Choice on them. <laughs> but yeah. um, and then Bling Ring, I just I just haven't gotten. But with our new film coming out, I thought it would be a appropriate time to kind of plug more Sophia Coppola. I brought up the Virgin Suicides so many times on the podcast um, just because I think it's an extraordinary film. And of course, she's known for her second film, Lost in Translation, uh, which I believe is getting a 4K UHD release. Right, Stephen? I, yeah. yeah. So that's going to get a nice upgrade. Yeah. Yeah. So, But back to here, similar themes in here that are also similar themes in Red Sun. So that's the main connection I have with these two films. 
Awesome. Um, who's your, I mean, other than Francis Ford Coppola himself, who's the second best Coppola? Is it Sophia? I mean, well, don't, yeah. I, I'm, this is not a trick question. It's Nicholas Cage, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a trick question. Yeah, it was a trick question. I was yeah. going to say Roman Coppola, who does write some no, pretty good screenplays with Wes Anderson. If I had to, I mean, like, I love Nicholas Cage. Sophia Coppola, if you're talking directors, obviously. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, Jason Schwartzman, I believe, is also a Coppola. Well, mm. but he's like after the fact. It's not like a <laughs> straight up co. You know, it's he had to marry into it or something, right? So he's a nephew. He's a nephew or something. I, I believe know. he's a nephew. Yeah. As, well, as he, Cope, as he's Nick, a little further away as Nick Cage is as well. Yeah, true. So, so Sophie is the second best Coppola. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're doing this Game of Thrones style. It's it's from you know children <laughs> yeah, to no. the nephew. It's like game. a dynasty. It's a dynasty. It's yeah, a, yeah. You gotta uh, go the royalty. Down yeah. But yeah, cool. I, yeah, I like that movie. I like both versions of that movie. Um, Clint Eastwood's, you know, sweaty and just a, they're both sweaty, uh, sweaty South lusty movies. Um, yeah. Yeah I, I like, yeah. I really like the Coppola one as well. Yeah. It's weird. It's like, I, I saw it when it came out, it kind of came and went like no one really yeah. talks. About it. A lot of people even forget it, it exists. Um, but I think like it's a powerhouse cast of performances in it and uh and look they're, they're both very different versions uh the clint one but yeah it's, it's very powerful but yeah it's um one that needs to i guess be brought back in the conscious and yeah so yeah i, I do like it a lot i saw it when it came I, out i wonder if it's maybe because most of coppola's movies or sophia's movies are like really stylish and like colorful and like this is a little bit more germ like it's a little more toned down Maybe than it, some some of our other films. Maybe I don't know. It's not as um, look, it is a mainstream, but it's not as mainstream. Some of I wouldn't say mainstream, but more uh, inviting than some of her other films. It's a bit lot darker than her other yeah. films have done. So mm. yeah, maybe a bit off putting for some. Yeah, maybe. what is interesting is that it, I feel like it, even with her newest film, Priscilla, is very much in the vein of the beguiled, like mm. looking at some kind of serious themes of like you know control and you know control obsession oppression you know uh, hidden emotions buried emotions stuff like that which are rather serious themes that are a lot more well thing is even like something lost in translation was dealing with serious themes of yeah. like kind of um not depression but like being cast aside or forgotten because you know this idea of two lost souls meeting each other in the more most obscure place you know just at a hotel in the middle of what Tokyo, I believe, where Lost in Translation is set, and you know, dealing with those themes of you know finding friendship in odd places can be a rather rather serious, like life type of theme. Um, yeah, but I'm curious what Steven's going to pair his with. Mm. Mm. We got some classic film stuff going on there, so what are we going to get? Well, before we do that, uh, Josephine wants to say good night, guys. Going to bed. Uh, Josephine, before you go to bed, uh, I do want to say you asked one question about uh, whether I read Chris. Have have I read Christmas books to my my uh, child yet? Uh, not really. I mean, like, I don't think I have. Not like not like a straight up Christmas story. I'll show you something I did read to her today. Um, I, I'll, I shout out to uh, Dan Skip Allen, a friend of ours. He sent me this. This was supposed to be a present last Christmas, but he finally got around to giving it to me this Christmas. Is this book of children's books of? Uh, cinephiles the first movie <laughs> and it's like one for noir new way uh french new wave and giallo horror so i read i read her the film noir one and uh it's it's pretty hilarious um you know it's a it's a cardboard back um you know and it's got like stuff about film noir you know femme fatales you know <laughs> it's 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 pretty awesome so double crosses you know, and it's got imagery of famous film noir films. So, Private Eyes. That's very, yeah. very cool. I didn't even yeah, know that. I love it. I have a book existed. <laughs> That's amazing. You should see the Giallo horror one. It's pretty graphic <laughs> for, for a children's book. I'm like, it's got like knives with blood on it. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> All right. But, um, and uh, also, just Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Josephine. Thank you for joining us. Tony said that was beautiful. Very beautiful. <laughs> of course. It is. Get him out. Um, all right. So when it came to choosing what I wanted to pair here, um, I, I, I first thing is I, I did want to keep it Christmas. I wanted to make sure I found another Christmas movie and, um, 
I started thinking about like, you know, I, I you know, I like that. I like to pair thematically. I do like to pair thematically, but it's, it's tough because Christmas movies, it, it, it doesn't go too crazy deep. Like they're not too many, like really deep Christmas movies. They're usually like, you know, love stories or f they're family films. So, uh, I wanted to pick something with, with, with a, with a love story in it. And, one that came out just a year later in 1940 uh, from another filmmaker who is kind of considered one of the best of his of that time, Ernest Lubitsch. And that is shop around the corner. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Andrew's like, I knew it was coming. As soon as he said 1940, I'm like, wait a minute. That sounds about, that sounds about right. Sounds about, uh, it sounds about like a shop around the <laughs> 1940. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Shop Around the Corner, um, 1940. Ernest Lubitsch wrote and directed this, starring Jimmy Stewart um, and uh, Margaret Sullivan. Um, and it's about this uh, little little shop. Uh, little I, every time I say little shop, it makes me want to say Wayne's World. Little sweet shop on the edge of town. <laughs> um, but uh, so it's this little like it's this shop, and uh, Jimmy Stewart plays like kind of the, one of the head clerks. He does really well. Um, and the, the girl, this girl comes in, uh, played by Margaret Sullivan, who wants a job. Um, she kind of talks her way into it, gets her way in there and starts working there. And these guys work together for a while for like six months and they kind of back and forth at each other's throats all the time. So they, they seem on the surface not to like each other, but, uh, Jimmy Stewart's been, uh, kind of having a pen pal with somebody that. He, he's kind of like falling in love with through through these written written letters and and uh you know this isn't a spoiler this is like the main part of the story should i say it is that spoiling the movie i would say hmm. don't say it but let's just say there's a connection between the two that they did not expect yeah there's a connection between these two and and it, it starts to shape the movie. I, I don't know. I, it's hard to say that you're telling me I can't say anymore. Basically <laughs> um, I'm handcuffed here, but it's a, it's a really, uh, really well-written uh, love story. Um, one of the things that I really dug about, I, I think that I, I found a connection between the two, two main love interests and in, and in Re remember the night is like I said earlier, like there's a lot of assuming like people, judge people and they assume that they're not into something or they're not, you know, they're not smart or they're not this or they're not that. And that happens a lot in this movie uh, that they, these two people really don't know each other, even though they work next to each other all the time. And they really are themselves through these letters. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's really wonderful movie. Uh, really great ending as well. Um, and uh it, it, honestly, I mean, I already, I mean, obviously I'd already seen the film. It is one of my favorite. I, I think this is a better movie than remember the night. Personally, uh, I would probably put remember the night as the first feature. And then this would be the second feature. Um, Cause it's just, it's just so great. Jimmy Stewart. Um, he's really young in this film. He looks young and thin and just, yeah. Uh, and it's, <coughs> excuse me. It's a, uh, it's just a sweet film. Uh, anybody else on shop around the corner? John. Yeah. It, it's one I haven't seen. It's, it's been on oh, my you list. Haven't seen it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Cause I know of it and uh, it, it pops up on Warner archive sales. It comes up every now and then it's one I've um, yeah, just never had a chance to pick up. But after that glowing review, I'm, I'll be getting it next Warner sale. I see it. Yeah. It, it's definitely worth it. And the Warner archive released over the last several years. I think we've, I've said it many times. They look, stunning whatever work yeah. they've been doing over there in terms of restoration in terms of picture quality on their releases are fantastic i mean they the one thing with the warner archive release i think we've mentioned many times Stephen, is there's not a lot when it comes to special features essentially if they were released on dvd those are the features you're going to get they're just ported right over um but the picture quality i think makes up for it because some of these films are from like you know 1940 and they mm -hmm. look absolutely stunning especially that black yeah. and white richness and you know high definition um uh this film is probably even uh also known for being the film that you got mail was a remake of well yeah uh, uh, yeah uh tony just brought that up a second ago he's like have you seen the remake you've got mail of course yeah of course that uh, tom hanks meg ryan 
Yeah. Who didn't see that growing up? That yeah, yeah that's a movie that I perennially see people rewatch constantly. Yeah. They they post it on uh, social media and stuff like that. That was a big movie when it came out. Yeah. Not big, big. It was like in the public conscious because, you know, at the time, uh, the term "you've got mail" was all over the pop culture world because of. AOL and email was kind of a new thing. And every time you logged into your AOL account, you get, the, you get the audio, you've got mail. Uh, you know what I mean? It's kind of ancient now. And I'm pretty sure yeah. you it's know, real time. I have no idea what we're talking about. No, no, yeah. <laughs> nothing, but it was a revolutionary in the nineties telling me like this was when the internet first hit and you got that, you had that, that dial up sound. It was riveting. Just <laughs> absolutely riveting. <laughs> You could you couldn't make phone calls for as for all the time, and if your phone rang, you got knocked off of the internet. It was amazing. Yeah, <laughs> but opening. I was so much more patient then. <laughs> I think we all were. Yeah, we were yeah. captivated by what was happening. Um, yeah, you could watch, you know, movie trailers on the internet was huge. Downloaded uh, QuickTime file. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the QuickTime files, and they had different <laughs> sizes depending on you know the quality you wanted to watch it in. Um, tell you that that Fellowship of the Ring trailer when it hit in the early 2000s you know, set my little mind into overdrive, just just yep. exploded. Uh, but yeah, the concept of you've got mail just fascinating. How like that's where we started with all of this, and now here we are, you know, video chatting with someone halfway across the world. You know, it's just yeah, it's amazing. The yep. cable guy was right, the cable guy was right, Jim Carrey. Um, uh, so but yeah, a shop around the corner is, I think, just a beautiful classic classic of a film you know heaping with that old you know romance that still i think captures our hearts today you know what i mean because it, it is very relevant in terms of finding love in unexpected places which happens all the time most definitely uh, i'm adding into the cart right now on amazon I so. <laughs> um, is I have to find my copy of it because I'm not sure where it actually is. Now that Stephen brought it up, it's gonna. As soon as we sign off, I'm gonna is look it through not my in the Jimmy Stewart comment. section. I don't have one actually. How in hell? I've heard you say some very obscure sections, but you don't have a Jimmy Stewart. I don't section? have actors. I don't have actor sections. I've got directors. You do sections. directors and. And yeah, I have like, directors and genres, but not specific actors, which does make it tough to find like specific actor stuff because i have yeah, to remember yeah. where they are in different areas I, if i ever organize my collection like legitimately it, it the only thing that works for me is alphabetically i i and that just yeah. I, I, Simple. I i have a hard time winning to uh mix up all my lab labels like I, I right now it's mostly label yeah, by label, label. Too. labels and alphabetical that's how i do it, it. well see i don't even do that i just <laughs> i just throw them up there um wherever they fit i guess wherever they fit on my shelf i'm about you know I'm a, i I just got a hold of a bunch of like uh shelving that was going to get thrown away at a, one of my stores that i work in so i'm about to fucking add some, <laughs> some some extra little like nice shelf stuff all over this room so i mean yeah. i still got some good shelf room over here but I had yeah. to I had to double stack mine they they go yeah yeah, yeah same just, here yeah but there's a but, but look, if it's a label, it's spine, then I'll go spine numbers. But if it's, yeah, it depends on the label, but I'll just yeah. try to group them together. It's all the arrow stuff. So, yeah, put them all in one place. Yeah, but, Tony uh, says he has his collection like mine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I've got the archives together. They all nicely worn our archive. But you're right. I was about to say the quality is unbelievable. Like, it's like you could swear it's almost like 4K, but it's not. Some of those, those Blu rays, the way they master them, it's like on my 4K player upscaling just looks phenomenal. So, yeah. yeah. They're masters of what they do. Warner yeah, I Archive. picked up a few Warner Archives recently because they'll randomly go on sale on Amazon US yeah. for like absurd prices, low prices, yeah. and they'll, you'll just stumble upon them. Like I got um, them across uh, here on Amazon yeah. AU. They'll drop just yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like I'll cry tomorrow, which was like nine dollars, and the same thing for the Prince and the Showgirl, which I think is uh, you know the Marilyn Monroe film that I actually really like, but I guess it's not one of her more favorites amongst her enthusiasts. Um, yeah. It's the one with Lawrence Olivier. And it, yeah. um, I pick up yeah, a few of those here and there. That's another, like, one or archive is another one where I pick up here and there, depending on just when you stumble across good pricing. You kind of take yeah. advantage yeah. of it. 
that's why I do. Yeah, I generally I'll put add them to the watch list, but I know they will eventually drop. If, if it's a tile I really want, I'll get on the day. But with archive, yeah, they'll they will eventually drop randomly. So, and th- th- I picked up those ones as well, and a bunch of others. I think um, uh, recently, Little Women, um, uh, Troy, and a, a bunch of them just arrived the other day. But they they were yeah absurdly cheap. It was very unusual. Yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, we've done it, guys. We've done it again. We we all watched a new movie. <laughs> That's all. That's what we're all about here, um, John. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, we hope uh, hope it didn't inconvenience your day. I know it's like the morning or middle of the day for you. I think it's fine. Yeah, afternoon. It's all good. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, the shops are open late, so I'll be doing some last minute Christmas shopping tonight. Ah, yes. Uh, yeah, it'll be a jingle all the way. That's going to be me. Um, oh, that's going to you get It's Turbo Time. <laughs> I I just actually watched that the other day. It, I was like, man, I love this movie. So good. So that's yeah. gonna be me. He got two. He got two. Yeah. That's good. Put the cookie down. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean. my wife's cookie. Yeah. <laughs> He's putting my star on the tree in my house <laughs> with my wife. <laughs> yeah, it's just I love that movie. Classic. Um, it's one that you know. Once again, it was at the time. Oh, you know, critics hated it, but it's become a classic. It's, oh yeah, it's yeah. Jake Lloyd's favorite, best performance. Um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> It's the only one we want to talk about. Um, uh, unf- it's unfortunate. As a, his whole Star Wars career was unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I hope you have a good Christmas, man. Uh, it, how is I mean, with it being so hot, how is Christmas in Australia? Like, is it? Yeah, just- very, very different. Yeah. So basically, because of the heat, most people go to the beach. Uh, so very. Yes. Uh, yeah, so people day. open it. Are people opening presents on the be- beach? Like. With yeah. trees like in the yeah, sand, people, people will take them. Traditions, yeah, they will, and they'll um have like a have a beer and they'll sit yeah. on the, the ba- um on the beach. But uh, yeah, we generally like our our Christmas lunches are generally like prawns, ham, like really kind of cold food, I guess, because yeah. it's cooler, so not really the the turkey uh, or anything like that. So uh, and yeah, it's it's just just very different. So you usually go out on Christmas Day because it's so hot, so it's gonna yeah, be hot. Yeah scorcher but yeah that, that's generally what we do and uh and we're all wearing t-shirts and shorts so very different to what's going, what's going on over it is different and it, I, it, it, and I, I don't mind it it sounds kind of cool um i yeah. mean uh i uh we're doing uh apparently my mom is doing uh she decided to just go crazy she was like we're doing a mexican christmas this year so <laughs> i'm eating mexican food tomorrow apparently um <laughs> so, fleece yeah. die die i guess yeah um so yeah, Andrew, what is house Christmas for you? Fine. I mean, it's gonna be. Um, is there gonna be a lot of family over? No, I don't. I, I honestly don't don't believe so. Um, it it the one thing with family holidays, I think over time is it's gotten smaller and smaller, um, just because sadly people pass away and yeah. sadly people move away and just things happen over time. So it's, it's relatively small now, uh, but. Uh, yeah, in terms of food, I guess this is a little bit different. I'm having baked stuffed shrimp, so I guess a little, Jeez, a little Australian seafoodish. Aussie, uh, yeah, Aussie style. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, well, I, I have it. Uh, I have it for Easter, and I have it for Thanksgiving as well. So I, I, I do, I do like a good baked stuffed shrimp. Um, being on the East Coast and being from the Ocean State, seafood is a big thing here. <laughs> Who would have guessed? Who would have guessed? Yeah, uh, yeah. Also, uh, stuffed shells as well, like like mm-hmm. pasta shells stuffed with like uh like spinach and ricotta cheese so a little i guess a little italian style it's a very fusion type of menu here and i think it also some some prime rib steak as well so it, it's Jeez. going all over the place in terms of the menu <laughs> we're all over the place um but yeah it's it should be relatively low key i this time of year i was saying earlier is such a blur of a time of year i don't know if that if anyone else can kind of feel that i don't know if it has to do with um having memories of being in school as a kid and having like the last two, you know, last 12 days of the year off. And it's just like a magical time. I just feel like it's such a blur. Like the end of the year, no one wants to be productive. No one wants to do anything is just get to that Christmas date and then coast to the new year. That seems to be what people tend to tend to vibe like, but I, I just, it just hits me a little bit earlier, I guess. Well, yeah. Same, same. Like it's, I was working up until yesterday. Like there wasn't much of a break uh, leading up to it. And that's why I'm, I left everything last minute. But yeah, previous years, it yeah, felt when we were younger, like it was, you know, you'd be counting down the calendar. And now it's like, oh, it's already Christmas. Well, what happened? Like 
with the month go. So wow. it's crazy. Christmas is literally the only day my job lets me have off. So <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, I guess I'm looking forward to it, but I just, I, you know, at this point, I just like might as well work. I don't know. What's <laughs> it's, Is it worth it? I don't know. If the stores are closed, I can't do nothing about it. So the other different thing about Australia is culturally, we have like a holiday shutdown. So every business is off for like a week or two, like completely wow. shut down. Yeah, like most, I mean, obviously retailers and stuff are open, but in terms of like most offices, like they're closed, which is quite a shock because I um, worked in the US for a bit and it was just, no, there's no such thing. It's like, you know, when yeah, I went. No, we don't, office, we don't stop. Like, yeah, yeah, I was telling my US colleagues like, what, what? No, no. It's like, <laughs> so here it's like, mate, just go to the beach, have a beer, sit back. It's <laughs> very different. Yeah, 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 I know what other countries, a lot of other countries, man, they understand. They're like, you need to have vacations so you don't, you know, you know. Yeah. decide to off yourself uh because you hate your job so much um mm. so yeah uh we need to take some of that lesson but we won't get a transfer down here bring your family Dude, I, I, I wish i could man sometimes i wish um but guys i want to i want to tell uh everybody here and everybody listening or gonna listen in the future have a merry christmas um john please tell everybody where they can find you yeah, so you can find me on Letterboxd. It's under just my name, John Matthews, but with one T. So you'll find me quite easily. Uh, yeah, obviously, I'm on Indicator Cast. We're getting that show back off the ground. Uh, some of our co hosts were a bit busy with life and schedules. So we, we got, next year, we're going to get it back on track. And obviously, you can find me on uh, Imprint Cast as well with Tony, who's here as well, Tony Meaches. Uh, just search Imprint Cast. And uh, you'll find me on the Indicator Facebook group and Imprint group as well. So I'm around or, or on you know, social media. Just send me a request. I'm around. Yeah. like talk movies awesome awesome you, Dan. and dan yes he said we did great work tonight good job guys all right well we know where you find me and andrew andrew and i are on chasing labels uh, weekly we will be going to a bi-weekly show here soon so nobody get mad at it we, we don't get mad we, we're, we're going to change the format up a little bit on chasing labels if you uh, want to get mad at like, anybody get mad at steven Get mad at me. Take it's all always complaints. anytime yeah. that something changes, it's because of me. <laughs> um, but uh, but we will we'll be back uh, for chasing labels. I believe it'll be January eighth or 9th. You'll see the first episode, and that's going to be our um, favorites of twenty twenty three uh, episode. And we're going to do it shelf shock rewind style. Uh, I don't know if I told you that, Andrew. Oh yeah, I did. Told you that. I told you that last Yesterday. night. Yeah, uh, we're going to do it shelf shock rewind style. Of course, shelf shock. Uh, Real Rewards, the, the show that me and Ryan Verrill from Disconnected uh, started last year. It's coming back, of course, this year, February 18th. Um, and we're going to do our uh, favorites of the year with the categories that are at Shelf Shock. So we're going to run down, probably not go super in depth, but we're going to run down all the categories, kind of say what we would, you know, me and Andrew are part of the uh, CSC that helped come up with the nominees. So we're, we are, you know, we will kind of give you a little bit of a sneak peek of where our minds were when we uh, put in our nominee uh, votes. So um, that'll be on that. And then after that, I think we're going to do every other week with chasing labels. So, uh, but of course, unwatch pile will be back again next month um, with another guest and uh, all right, well, that's it. Thanks everybody for uh, joining us. And uh, what are you doing here? <laughs> go get, go get your movies. Get out, get out of here. See you guys. <laughs>